reason why I titled this broadcast, What is the Rapture and Seven Proofs of a Pre-Tribulation Rapture, is because um, at large, people do not live in light of the rapture. People aren't living in light of the second coming. Most people, most people... Uh, this is what Leonard Ravenhill used to say. Leonard Ravenhill, who was a great man of God, passed away in the 90s, I believe it was. He said that people sing about the coming of the Lord. They, they preach on the coming of the Lord. There's people that can quote the verses on the coming of the Lord. They sing it in their songs, but they don't live in light of the coming of the Lord. So this broadcast is to realign people's spirits to be in alignment with the divine truth that Jesus Christ is coming for his church so that you can live accordingly, so that you can live in a, a pursuit of, of purity, pursuit of purpose, and a pursuit of God's plan for your life. We're not just to be, you know, people always say the term rapture ready. I'm rapture ready. What does rapture ready mean? Rapture ready does not mean I go to church on Sunday. Rapture ready does not mean I warm up a church pew every Sunday. I have my specific seat that I have reserved in church and the people know me there. That's not what rapture ready is. Rapture ready isn't just, you know, I, I, I take time every Every, every time before I eat, I spend at least one minute in prayer giving thanks to God for everything I've got. That's not what rapture ready is. Rapture ready, living in light of the return of Jesus Christ for his church, is having your hand put to the plow and working in the harvest fields before it is is too late. You know, the Bible says there's two types of people. There's people that who have their eyes set on temporal things, people that have their eyes set on the things which are seen, things that are of this world. They have covetous, covetousness in their heart. They chase after material possessions. They literally live their lives nine to five working, checking in, checking out so they can save up for what, 10, 15, 20, 30 years if, if, if you're really you know lucky of retirement. All for that, after everything is said and done, we all end up, you cannot take a U-Haul to the, to the grave. Everybody that I've seen buried in my lifetime, they were buried with a suit on, with a dress on, with their hands folded and in the ground. And that was the end of it. But there is a day where we're going to be, the Bible says, the dead in Christ will rise first. And we who are alive and remain on the earth will be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. And the Bible says, when that happens, we will be like him, for we will see him as he is. And 1 John chapter 3 says, therefore knowing these things, what manner of lives ought we to live? He that know, has this hope in himself, he should keep himself pure, even as Christ is pure. When you understand the imminency of the rapture and the closeness of this major event that the Bible has described time and time again, there's no time for chasing after material possession. I'm not trying to build up a kingdom on this earth because the scripture says that moths can break in, uh, moths can destroy, thieves can break in and steal these material possessions. But there is a treasure that you can store up for yourself. This, there is a, a treasure that you can store up for yourself in heaven where moth does not break in, uh, moth does not destroy, and thieves do not break in and steal. The Bible says there's going to be a day where the fire of God is going to test the works that we've accumulated on this earth and it'll test the quality of work there's some people that they're building in wood they're building in straw they're building in hay all temporal things and the fire is going to burn it up and the scripture says this is not even talking about the unbelievers it's not even talking about people that don't know christ it's talking about people that are in the church that they've built, they've kept their eyes on this earth they've not acted as pilgrims passing through but they have they have um, established themselves in this world. As such, their works will be burnt up by fire, yet they themselves will be saved, not so as through fire. But the Bible talks about a second class of people, and those are the ones who have built in gold, built in silver, built in precious stone. Those people, the Bible says, will receive a reward. There is a day of reward that is coming. There is a day of recompense. There is a day where the Bible says, Paul said it this way 
In the future, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord will give to all those that love his appearing. I don't know about you, but given the time and the signs of the times and the things that have transpired in the last 18 months, I am more than ready and more than looking forward to the, re the rapture of the church of Jesus Christ. I, the Bible says we are to hasten, looking for and hastening the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. I know that his return is near, but I'm not just just going to sit on my blessed assurance and wait for that day. I'm going to be the servant. I'm going to be the steward. And I know that the grace of God has drawn you to this broadcast because you're just like me. You want to be the one who has his hand put to the plow and is running in the direction of God, doing the work of God, accomplishing exploits for God so that we work while it is yet day for night comes when no man can work. And when that day comes, we're going to be the ones that hear the words from God the Father. Well done done good and faithful servant come and inherit the kingdom that God has prepared for you so today I want to get in it because there's a lot to cover what is the rapture what is the timing of the rapture and what are seven biblical proofs that the church is not going to be on the earth during the rapture. Seven biblical proofs that show a pre-tribulation rapture. Now, I know there's some people watching. You might be a post-tribulation rapturist. You might be a mid-tribulation rapturist. You might hold some other viewpoint. We can still get along. We can still be friends. I just wanted to show you why I believe in a pre-tribulation rapture. This is not something to separate the body of Christ. This is not something that should uh, destroy friendships. This is not something that should cause you, I hate this guy i don't want to ever listen to him again this is a point that i believe is important and actually i'm going to show you why the pre-tribulation the way you interpret the tribulation if the church will be on earth during the tribulation actually will spill into all the other fields of theological um understanding so it's actually not just some like doctrine that you know whatever you hold one day we'll find out it's a doctrine that's going to spill over into every other theological um, truth found in the Bible. And so that's why I thought it important to show you seven proofs, biblical proofs, not things that I think, not something I've read in another book, biblical proofs as to why the church is not going to be on the earth during the rapture. But before I can get there, I want to give a brief definition, a description. What is the rapture? What is the rapture of the church? What does the word rapture even mean? Can we find it in the Bible? Well, number one, the word rapture, before I get there, let me describe the event of the rapture. The event of the rapture, in brief, is the catching away of the saints that are on the earth and the raising of those that have died in Christ. It is a future event when Jesus Christ will descend from heaven and in a moment of time, he will resurrect the believers that have died in Christ and those who are alive on the earth and have kept their garments white and their lamps burning will be raised with Christ, uh, with, will be raised up, caught up in the air to meet those that are dead in Christ that have been raised up and to meet Christ in the air, in the clouds. Now, it's important to note there is a distinction. And I need to do this before I move on to anything else or else you're going to be completely confused for the rest of the broadcast. There is a distinction between the rapture of the church and the second coming of Christ. There is a di description. By the way, people in the chat, do not give any attention to the person that's trying to cause division. Just let him say whatever he wants to say. The best thing you can do is just let him be and move on, focus on the broadcast, put out fire emoji, emojis if something strikes with something in, in your spirit, if something if blesses you, if something gives you faith, if something encourages you, put out fire emojis, put out hands up, whatever. Put out emojis, say amen, shout hallelujah, do whatever you want, just whatever you do, do not give attention. Jesus didn't address the naysayers, you don't address the people that are in direct opposition to his body just let them be it's fine it's fine they're not hurting my feelings they shouldn't hurt your feelings uh don't be like peter taking out the sword and striking down the the, the ear of the servant of the high priest just keep on moving on we're gonna get through it it's fine this is nothing just move on 
Also, if you can share the broadcast, that's another thing. If you see people are trying to hate on it, share the broadcast. Get this out to more people so we can reach more people with this message of truth and help more people before everything is said and done. Um, and it's going to bless you. This, the reason why I'm talking about the rapture, I, I alluded to it before. It's first going to help you because it's going to give you a drive and a diligence to keep yourself pure. For the Bible says, he that has this hope in himself keeps himself pure even as Christ is pure. Secondly, it's going to put a responsibility and an urgency in your heart for your generation to see people saved in your generation, to see people won to the kingdom of God before all things are said and done. And then thirdly, it's going to cause you to restructure your priorities restructure and realign your priorities so that when Christ does come we're not found drinking and eating and the Bible says as the days of Noah were before the days of Noah before the days of the flood the flood the Bible says they were eating and drinking marrying and giving in marriage they were pretty much living lavicious lives they were living haphazardly they were living you know come as it will they were living as the eat drink and be merry for tomorrow we die mentality and the flood overtook them when you have this hope in you and not just you know you hear the word rap once a year at church i'm talking about you live just like the early church did with the reality of this event that's going to take place one day and i believe very soon when you live with that awareness in your heart when you live with the firm conviction that we are coming to the close of the age it's going to it's going to affect and influence the way you run your life what you prioritize what you give attention to what you focus on and also how you treat others so share this broadcast share it as often as you can it's going to help a lot of people so what is the rapture it is a future event when Jesus Christ will descend from heaven and in a moment of time, the Bible says in the twinkling of an eye, the dead in Christ will rise and then we who are alive will be caught up raptured up to meet the lord in the air and so shall we be always we're going to be in this glorious presence from that moment onward forever for all eternity so the key points is the rapture number one is a future event It's not something that has happened and we're in the great tribulation right now it is a future event number two jesus the rapture is jesus descending from heaven the distinction between the rapture and the second coming, before I move on to anything else, the rapture is Jesus descending from heaven and meeting us in the clouds. He does not touch the earth. The second coming is Christ coming with his church, with his bride, to the earth where his feet will descend upon the Mount of Olives and wage war against the devil and um, the Antichrist and the false prophet and the false, the, the, the beast and the false prophet. So the Bible says there is a distinction between the rapture and the second coming. Very brief description. The rapture is Jesus coming for his church where he meets, where we meet him in the clouds. He does not touch ground on that, in that event. The second coming is Christ coming with his church where we will be on horses of white with crowns of righteousness, garments of white behind him as we come back to the earth with christ enoch in jude the book of jude the bible says enoch the seventh of adam prophesied and he was prophesying not of the rapture he was prophesying of the second coming the close of the age i see the lord coming with not for i see the lord coming with ten thousand and thousands of his saints so there's a distinction but key points of the rapture the rapture is a future event Jesus will descend from heaven for his church. Dead believers will rise first and rise out of the grave and will be made like Christ for they shall see him as he is. And then we who are alive will be caught up, raptured up to be with him. And then Christ will escort his church to heaven where there will be the judgment seat of Christ. There will be events that are happening in heaven at the same time as events happening on the earth. While the tribulation is taking place on earth, we, the church, will be going through the judgment seat of Christ where there's two judgments in the Bible. There's the judgment seat of the great white throne. That's not the judgment of the believer. There is a judgment seat of Christ. That is the judgment of the believer where we will be judged by Christ based on what we have done, how we've lived, what we did with the gospel message, how we shared it. 
That we didn't just sit on it, just like the parable of the, the talents, the five talents that was given to one man. He went and made five more talents. Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter in. The other one had two talents. Well done, good and faithful servant. So we're going to be judged based on what we did. Did we multiply the fruit that Christ put in us? Did we increase did we, um, did we share this message of the gospel of Jesus Christ to make it known as much as we could? We can influence whether people accept it or not, but we can share this message. We're going to be judged for that. And then there's the marriage supper of the Lamb, which will happen at the end of the seven years. The reality of the rapture is in the scriptures. I'm going to read first and foremost Philippians chapter 3. So where do we get this rapture from? What what is this rapture? I mean, did someone just come up with it? Because that's the problem a lot of people have with the rapture. They think that in the 1830s, a guy named J.N. Darby came up with this doctrine of the pre-tribulation rapture that the early church didn't believe in, apparently. They, the church fathers from the early period of Christianity till the 1800s did not believe in it. They say that even the reformists didn't even believe in it. And so it, as such... Not they didn't believe in it. They didn't know it. They, didn't, they hadn't discovered this truth. And so as such, we shouldn't even dive into it. It must not be true because history shows not many people actually taught on the pre-tribulation rapture. Well, that's a faulty argument because up until the year 1560, the Catholic church at large with Catholic, Catholic just means general church. So the general church didn't did not um, believe in the doctrine of justification by faith and faith alone. So for many years, up until the 1500s, when Martin Luther nailed the 95 Thesis to the door and he reformed the Christian faith, called them the Protestants, the ones who believed in justification by faith and faith alone, that it's not you're not saved by works, you are saved by grace through faith. It is not your work, it is the work of God, lest any man should boast. So if we're going to go with the whole, well, hist the historical church didn't really teach on that, then it must not be true. Then we also have to say that the justification by faith is not true. Just because a truth is not taught does not mean that the truth itself loses its credibility. I want you to pay special attention to what I just said. Just because a truth is not taught does not mean the truth loses its credibility. Truth is truth, whether people taught it or not. Truth remains truth. The Bible says the word of the Lord endures forever. The word of God is the incorruptible seed. Whether men believe in it or not believe in it, it remains the same. The fact that some people do not believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ doesn't change the fact that Christ rose from the grave. Christ is alive and he lives forevermore. The fact that people don't believe in the doctrine of divine healing does not mean that divine healing is not a biblical truth the fact that some people believe that God sends some to hell and sends some to heaven and ultimately it has nothing to do with what we decide it's what God decides does not mean that that's a true doctrine just because someone teaches something doesn't make it truth and just because someone doesn't teach something does not make it untrue we have to go to the scripture we have to not make experience or our own understanding, our directive in life for truth, we have to make the scriptures, we have to look to the Holy Bible and make it the ultimate and the authority for truth in our life if we're going to live lives that please God. And so, Philippians 3, which was written by Paul in the first century A.D., this is what he says. So people that say the church didn't teach this. This is Paul. This isn't John or J.N. Darby teaching this in 1830. This is from the first century A.D. Philippians chapter 3 and verse 19. Whose end is destruction. Whose God is their belly. And whose glory is in their shame. Who set their minds on earthly things. Verse 20. For our citizenship is in heaven. From which we also eagerly wait for the Savior. The Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body, that it may be conformed to his glorious body, according to the working by which he is able even to subdue all things to himself. What are four pinnacle scriptures, or four essential scriptures rather, in the Bible that define this rapture? Philippians 3, verses 20 and 21. The next one that I'm going to read is 1 Thessalonians. Actually, I'll read John 14 first. John chapter 14, 
John chapter 14 and beginning with verse 1. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. But I'm going to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. And key, key note in this scripture, and I will receive you to myself. We said it before. The rapture is Christ receiving his bride. The second coming is Christ coming back with his bride. This is a scripture defining or describing the event called the rapture. I will come again and receive you to myself that where I am, you may be also. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, another key scripture that describes the rapture of the church. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 50. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit in corruption. Behold, I'm telling you a mystery. Now, I'm going to stop here because that word mystery is not talking about um, this complicated doctrine. He's not saying I'm bringing you something that's going to be very complex and hard to understand. That's not what the word mystery originally means in the Greek. The word mystery here is in reference to a new revelation, a fresh insight. Why is Paul saying I'm bringing you a mystery? Why is he saying I'm bringing you something new? Why is he saying I'm bringing you a new teaching? Because if you were to read the Bible from Genesis chapter 1 to 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 49 or verse 50, and you said that there is no event called a rapture, you might be able to get away with that because it, it you don't really see, outside of John 14, 1 through 3, you don't really see much strong points describing this event called the rapture until Paul says, I'm bringing you a mystery. Why is it a mystery? Because the Old Testament never taught the rapture. The Old Testament, which was to the Jewish people, taught the second coming. And I can get into all that, but I'm not going to. But the Old Testament was God's covenant with Israel, national Israel, describing the coming of Messiah the first time and then the coming of Messiah the second time in which all Israel will be saved. That's the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 15, 51, Paul says, I'm bringing you a mystery. He's saying it's not something that you've ever read or been taught, but I've received this from direct revelation from the Lord. We shall not all sleep. So the first part of that mystery, this new teaching, is that not everyone's going to die. Paul says not everyone is going to taste of death. There will be a people group on the earth during, the, during this time when the rapture takes place that are going to be alive in Christ, that are going to be faithful to the gospel, that are going to be hot on fire for God and not lukewarm, that are going to be caught up in the air. They're not going to die. They're going to be changed, however. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. For this corruptible will put on incorruption and this mortal will put on immortality. The fourth scripture, and this one's the, the, the rapture scripture of the Bible. There's no getting around it after this. Is 1 Thessalonians Chapter, five, uh, chapter 4 and beginning with verse 13. This is what the Bible says. By the way, if you're watching right now and this is helping you, share the broadcast. I don't know why we have, when I talk about end times, it's like we have lower viewership than when I talk about faith and miracles and the baptism in the Holy Ghost. All are important. And even though we've been having lower viewership in recent days since I've talked about these end times, I'm not going to stop because I will not shrink back from declaring the whole testimony and the counsel of God's truth. And so it might not be a popularity thing. It might not be something that gets people's hair to stand up behind their neck. It might not be a, something that gets people to, uh, you know, because some people are like, well, you know, whether it's post, mid, trip, whatever, pre, uh, we'll see when it gets there. And they, people are like live mindlessly. They don't care to dissect the word, to find out whether these things are so. They don't, there's a lot of people that, Unless it blesses me, unless it helps me, unless it's about healing or whatever, then I don't want to know it. That's not the, that's not, and I know that's not you because you're watching, but that's not the way people should be. Pete, if you're serious about your walk with the Lord and you 
have a heart for God and for his truth. David said, I've hidden thy word in my heart. You should hide his full word in your heart. Because everything, people say Bible prophecy is not important because whatever happens will happen and there's nothing you can do to change it. Bible prophecy prepares you. I've said it many times. Bible prophecy is not to scare you. Bible prophecy and the teaching of Bible prophecy is to prepare you. I'm going to say that again. The teaching of Bible prophecy is not to scare you. The teaching of Bible prophecy is to prepare you so that your lamp can be burning, your garments white and glistening, and your hand put to the plow, ready to meet the Lord when he comes. So share this. It's going to help you. It's going to help others. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 13. But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep in, in Christ, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. So the Bible says we as Christians, we shouldn't mourn the death of other believers the way the world mourns the death of their own. I, I never understand, like I'm not against mourning for someone that died in your family, whether they were saved or not. The Bible says, uh, blessed are the mourn, they shall be comforted. And the scripture says, mourn with those who mourn. There is a time of mourning, but I've never been able to understand when people are still getting over their loved one that died five, ten years ago, even three years ago, four years ago, that were saved, that are in Christ, who claim to believe in a real heaven, that are still crying themselves to sleep every night. The Bible says, Paul said it, don't mourn as those who have no hope. They mourn like that because they don't understand the reality of heaven and they're saved. Their, their loved ones may not have been saved so they don't understand this. They don't have foresight or insight rather into the, the, the coming of the new heaven and the new earth where the dead in Christ will rise and then we who are alive will be caught up and we'll be with the Lord forever. They don't understand the eternality of those that are in Christ Jesus. So they mourn that way. But it should not be so amongst you. It should not be so amongst his brother. I'm not saying if you lost someone and it's been a year and you're still like, you know, having a hard time getting over it and, and restructuring your life because they were a huge part in your life, even though they're saved and in heaven. But I am saying if five years, if 10 years from now, you're still not going, getting over and you're still stagnant and idle in the place and still weeping and still you've let that death literally paralyze your life, then it's another story. You have to understand there's the blessed hope of the resurrection that we're looking forward to the death for a child of god is not it's not goodbye it is good night it's not goodbye let me say that again the death of a child of god is not goodbye it is good night it is not see you never it is see you later it is not it is not uh you know annihilation they went back to the ground we'll never no it is see you later there's going to be a day where you'll see those loved ones that died in christ but then paul moves on to say in verse 14 if we believe that jesus died and rose again even so god will bring with him those who sleep in jesus for this we say to you by the word of the lord so paul's not saying something he came up with in studying scripture he's saying this is something i heard from the lord himself that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord, pay special attention, 1 Thessalonians verse, uh, chapter 4 and verse 16. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, and with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up, will be caught up, together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air and thus we shall be always with the Lord so comfort one another with these words a lot of people have a problem with the doctrine of the rapture because they say things like there is no word for rapture in the Bible in the King James version which some people literally hold the King James version as like more carrying more authority than the Greek and the Hebrew versions of the Bible, which is the original manuscripts language of those of those writings. Some people think King James is the 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 number one that even the Hebrew Bible is wrong and the Greek is wrong. It's King James first. Look, if you love the King James, I I, I read the New King James, which is just without the these and the thous. So I'm not trying to beat on the King James version of the Bible. I like the King James translation. I read. I refer to it often. 
But just because a word is not in the King James Version of the Bible does not mean it's not biblical. Remember, this might be a revelation to some people today, but I want to make it clear to you. The Bible was not written in English. Paul was not a student at Oxford or Harvard or New York State University. Paul was a Hebrew who knew the Hebrew language, the Greek language, and the epistles of Paul are written in Greek, they're written in the language of that day, which was Greek, a language everybody understood. It'd be like writing something in English today. Most people understand English, even people in other nations that speak other language. languages understand English. Well, in Paul's day, Greek was the language. And so when you see the word here in verse 16, I'm going to read it again, for the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout. Verse 17, then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together. That word caught up in the Greek is the word harpazo, harpazo. If you can write that in the comment section, it's H-A-R-P-A-Z or Z-O, harpazo. Harpazo in Greek, the meaning of the word is the catching away or the snatching up or the forceful removal of. So although the word in the King James Version and other translations of the Bible is not the exact word rapture. The meaning of caught up in the Greek, harpazo, is to be caught up, is to be raptured up. It's to be forcibly removed. And the reason why we translate it, uh, we have the word rapture to define this theological position is because in the Latin Bible, which was written um, I forget when, 400 in the 4th century, 5th century, 3rd century, something like that. In the Latin Bible, when it was translated from Greek, the word for caught up is rapturo. So the Latin word for rapture is rapturo, or caught up is rapturo. That's where we get the word rapture from. So people that say there's no word for rapture in the Bible, so I'm going to throw it out. It doesn't even mean anything to me. That's uh, Well, let's use that same uh, state of mind, that same mentality towards the word Trinity, because there's no Trinity in the Bible. There's no word for Trinity in the Bible. Yet we can see the evidence and presence of the divine Trinity all throughout the Bible. There's no word for immaculate conception in the Bible. Yet I hold to the theological stand, uh, viewpoint and position of the Virgin Mary giving birth to or, or conceiving Jesus by immaculate conception. There is no word for, get this, there's no word for Bible in the Bible. And yet I believe in the Bible. Just because there's no word for something in the Bible does not mean that it doesn't exist or it's not a theological um, position that scripture stands by. Could easily call it, you know, if you don't like the word rapture and you want to call it something else, call it the catching away of the saints. Call it the doctrine of the catching away or the catching, the snatching away or the doctrine of translation. There's other people that call it that. Whatever you want, it doesn't matter what you want to call it. The fact remains the same. From those four scriptures, the rapture is a biblical event that will transpire. Now, to prove even furthermore that there is a rapture that's going to happen and the reality of this catching away, there are actually five other raptures in the Bible. There are five other raptures in the Bible. Some of you, that might, you've never heard that before. Well, I want to go through the five raptures of the Bible. And I think there's uh, two others, but I, have, I don't have them written down. So for the sake of time, I'm going to do five raptures of the Bible. Five times where somebody, an individual, was caught up or snatched up into heaven. Number one, Enoch. That was the first rapture in the Bible. The first catching away. What do we read? Genesis chapter 5 and verse 24. This is what the Bible says. Genesis 5, 24. And Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. He snatched him up. He raptured him. Hebrews chapter 11, and uh, verse 5, I believe it is. Enoch, by faith, walked with God. And he did not see death, for God took him. For he had this testimony when he was on the earth that he pleased God. The first rapture found in the Bible is the rapture of Enoch. The second one is 2 Kings chapter 2, and verse 11. Elijah. Elijah did not die a natural death, just like Enoch did not die a natural death. They were taken up. They never tasted of death. 2 Kings chapter 2 and verse 11. This is what the Bible says. 
And then it happened as they continued on, Elijah and Elisha, and they were talking that suddenly a chariot of fire appeared with horses of fire and separated the two of them. And Elijah went up, snatched up, caught up by a whirlwind into heaven. And Elisha saw it and he cried out, my father, my father, the chariot of Israel and its horsemen. So he saw him no more. He took up his own clothes and tore them into two pieces. So the Bible says Elijah was caught up by a chariot of fire and a whirlwind from heaven so that he did not die a natural death of natural causes. God took him up. The third rapture of the Bible is Jesus was raptured. Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1 and verse 11. Listen to this. Acts chapter 1 verse 11. Let's start with verse 9. Now when he was speaking these things, while they watched him, he was taken up snatched up caught up and a cloud received him out of their sight and while they looked steadfastly towards heaven as he went up behold two men stood by them in white apparel who also said to them these were angels saying to the men to the disciples of christ as they watched him go men of galilee why do you stand here gazing up into heaven this same jesus who was taken up caught up snatched up rapturo from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. Jesus was, after he rose from the dead, 40 days later, the Bible says he remained with the disciples for 40 days by many infallible proofs. He was proving himself to be alive after his resurrection. But on that 40th day, 10 days before the Pentecost, the day of Pentecost, the Bible says he was caught up into heaven and a cloud received him out of heaven out of his sight, out of their sight. The fourth rapture of the Bible is in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, uh, chapter 12, sorry. Paul was raptured. Now, I'm not saying Paul didn't die. Paul eventually died, but the Bible describes a translation that had cured in his lifetime while he was obviously in some intense time of prayer. He was in some... Um, intense time of prayer he was obviously giving himself over to perhaps prayer and fasting the bible says it is doubtless not profitable for me to boast but i will come to visions and revelations of the lord i know a man and if you read any theological um book from any pretty much any even catholic presbyterian pentecostal whatever they all agree on this that paul is speaking of his own self he's not talking about some other dude that he knew he's talking about his own self paul says i know a man in christ who 14 years ago whether in the body or out of the body i don't even know god knows such a one was caught up to the third heaven he was translated he was taken. Paul said, it was so real to me. I don't even know if I was, if it was my spirit that was caught up or if my physical body was taken up to heaven. I don't even know. I don't even want to get into it. It was too complex for me to understand. But I do know one thing. I was caught up. I was raptured up. And he repeats it again. I know such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I don't know. God knows how he was caught up into where? paradise and he heard inexpressible words which is not lawful for men to idle to utter that's paul's translation the fourth rapture of the bible the fifth rapture of the bible that i have written down is in revelation chapter 4 revelation chapter 4 and verse 1 this is john on the island of patmos the bible says that he was in the spirit on the lord's day and he saw the lord whose eyes were like a flame of fire, whose hair is white as wool, and he started to tell him certain things that he told, to, he told John and instructed John to write in a book. Now, chapter 1 through 3, Jesus is talking to the churches, messages given to the churches, but chapter 4 verse 1 starts with this. After these things, what's after these things? What is these things? He's talking about the church age. I looked up and behold, standing open in heaven was a door, a portal in the original Greek. A portal was open in heaven and the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking with me saying, come up, come up and I'll show you things which must take place after this and I'll get into it afterwards but that's what I believe to be not only John being raptured up into heaven in his vision that he was seeing which I've included in the five raptures of the Bible but I believe that to be the exact moment where the church 
clothed in the true church, not just the professing church, because there's many people who profess to know Christ, but the book of Titus says, in works they deny him being abominable and unruly and evil in everything that they do. So I'm not talking about the professing church. Jesus says there's people that profess Christ, but they're lukewarm, and Jesus said, I'll vomit them out of my mouth. I'm talking about the true church, the church that is faithful, the church that does not love its life even unto death, the church that has overcome being born again, not someone who calls himself a Christian because he goes to church, not somebody who identifies as himself, himself as a Christian when the government census forms come out and he checks out the box that says Christian. I'm not talking about the guy that has a membership at a, membership at a church and as such di, um, identifies himself as a Christian. I'm talking about the genuine church of the Lord Jesus Christ. The ones that have been redeemed by the blood, who have turned from sin, have denied themselves, have picked up their cross and are following Christ even to the end, enduring to the end. That's where I believe that rapture will take place. There are five major views of the timing of the rapture. I entitled this broadcast today, The Timing of the Rapture. And what are the five major views? The number one view or viewpoint number one is the pre-tribulation rapture. This is the view that the rapture is going to take place before the day of God's wrath that shall come on the earth. The second major view of the timing of the rapture is the mid-tribulation rapture. This is the rapture that will take place in the middle of the seven years of tribulation that is God's wrath being poured out on the earth after three and a half years that Christ is going to come back for his church, but then at the end of the seven years, Christ will come back with his church. The third major view is the post-tribulation rapture. This is the viewpoint that Christ will come at the same time he will come back for his church and with his church. How do they explain that? That when the trumpet is sound, Christ is going to meet the church in the air, and in the air, somehow the I mean, this is where the doctrine is, is faulty in because there is a time span between and noted in scripture between the rapture and the second coming. They cannot be one event that occur immediately after another because between the rapture and the second coming, the book of Revelation talks about, as I said at the beginning of this broadcast, the judgment seat of Christ that the saints are going to go through talks about our rewarding our reward from heaven that's going to come where we're going to be clothed with white and we're going to receive crowns of righteousness. Then it talks about um, our presentation as the bride to Jesus Christ where God the Father is going to present us, His church, as the bride to Christ and we're going to rule and reign from forever, with Him forever. So that those events have to take place between the rapture and the second coming. So the post-tribulation rapturist believes that that's all going to happen in like a split second. That the rapture is going to happen. We're going to meet the Lord in the air. And at the same time, we're going to come back with him on horses dressed in white. And then everything's going to be said and done. And then we're going to have the marriage supper of the Lamb. Those are the five. Oh, no, that's three. Fourth. The fourth. Um, the fourth major view of the timing of the rapture is the partial rapture. This one, in my opinion, is the most screwed up one. This is the idea that Jesus Christ is going to come back for faithful believers at first, but those that were not so hot for God are going to have to go through the great tribulation period, and that time of testing is going to purge the ones that really had to go, and then the rest are going to finally be saved at the end of the seven years. That's the partial rapture. I wholeheartedly do not believe in that. Then there's the fifth major view of the timing of the rapture which is the pre-wrath rapture this is a rapture that happens three quarters of the way into the great tribulation they say when the seventh trumpet of god's wrath is sounded that that is exactly when the uh the rapture is going to take place and then there's going to be a time between that and the second coming those are the five major views on the timing of the rapture now here and i'm going to get in it seven biblical proofs why i believe in a pre-tribulation rapture. And as I said before, if you don't hold to this viewpoint, you can still listen, be informed. You know, it's a brilliant mind that stays open-minded and at least hears the other side. It's a man or a woman that is insecure in their own beliefs that 
can't even hear the other side. I don't just study my viewpoint. I study other people's viewpoints. When I talk about and I preach on healing, the reason why I can preach so strong on healing is because I've studied the people that don't believe in divine healing. I study the people that don't believe God still does miracles. I study the people that have totally thrown the baby out with the bathwater. I've studied all their objectives, I've objections, I've studied their arguments, and then I've looked at the word of God and I've looked at others who believe in healing and I've made my own my own um, decision on what I will believe. That's why I have weight when I preach on healing. Well, the same way you can have weight when you preach on a pre-tribulation rapture by studying what people, what other people believe and then why you believe uh, what you believe based on the scriptures. So why I believe in a pre-tribulation rapture, number one, number one. And any one of these points, in my opinion, is enough, but I'm going to go through seven just to like drill it in you today. Number one, there is no mention of the church after Revelation chapter four and verse one. Revelation chapter 2, 3, you see to the angel of the church, to the angel of the church of Ephesus, to the angel of the church of Smyrna, to the angel of the church of Pergamon, to the angel of the church of Philadelphia, to the angel of the church of Laodicea, you see Jesus is addressing the church, his bride on the earth, he's correcting them, he's diagnosing them, he's realigning them, he is informing them he is exhorting them he is encouraging them he is strengthening them you see that repeated very often from revelation 1 to the end of revelation chapter 3 and verse 22 he who has ears to hear let him hear what the spirit is saying to who to the churches revelation chapter 4 verse 1 begins with john seeing a portal open in heaven and a voice saying come up here the moment he hears those, that voice say come up here he's immediately translated into heaven and he says i now saw a throne set in heaven and one sat on the throne and he who sat on there on the throne was like a jasper and sardius stone in appearance and there was a rainbow around the throne in appearance like an emerald around the throne were 24 thrones and on the thrones i saw 24 elders which i'm going to talk about the elders further on in this broadcast very important to know who the angels are uh, who the elders are in the book of Revelation. And they had crowns of gold on their heads, and from the throne proceeded lightnings, thunderings, and voices. Seven lamps of fire were born in, burning before the throne of God, which are the seven spirits of God. And you hear uh, many songs that they're chanting. The cherubim are chant uh, the four living creatures are singing, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. The f 24 elders fall down singing, Worthy is the Lamb or the Lord to receive glory and honor and power. You created all things and you hear all these songs that heaven is, uh, is, is, is composing at this very time in history. But I want to make it clear from Revelation chapter 4 and verse 1 to, the, to Revelation chapter 22 and verse 16. The word ecclesia, church, is not mentioned at all. The great tribulation begins in Revelation chapter 6 and continues to Revelation chapter 19. From Revelation 6 to 19, you don't see the word church at all all you only see god's wrath being poured out you see these bowls of god's wrath you see the trumpets sounded and these awful terrible things happening during the great tribulation you see the uh, seals being opened by the lamb which is also a demonstration of or the infliction of the wrath of god on the earth where people are dying one third of the earth in one day great earthquakes causing the sun to be covered the sun turning to red the moon turning or the sun turning to black and the moon turning to red and these unprecedented events transpiring throughout these seven years from Revelation chapter 6 to 19. In it all, you don't see one mention of the church. Well, if you study prophecy throughout all scripture, even when God was prophesying difficult times for Israel, he always said, I'm going to remain, a, I'm going to leave a remnant in the land. And then he showed a plan for that remnant. He, he would always express his plan for the remnant. He would always declare and um, make evident his plan for the redeemed on the earth, even though they were going to go through these things. 
But the Bible says very clearly there's not even one mention. If the church was still on the earth during that time, don't you think Jesus would have taken time to at least bring up a plan of action for the church? Don't you think there would be some sort of indication that God, like God would say, I've got your back at least? Or, you know, if the tribulation is the time of God's wrath and we've not been appointed unto wrath, don't you think that there would be some sort of covenant protection that's demonstrated throughout this time that there'd be a scripture that at least says, but upon the righteous, they're, they're going to be exempt or upon my righteous ones, they're not going to have to t have this, not a dog. You know, just like when God was prophesying uh, through Moses, all these plagues that were going to come on Egypt. He always made a plan for Israel. He said, but unto you, not a dog will bark its mouth. But unto you, darkness will not touch you. Light will prevail in Goshen, even though there's darkness in Egypt. Unt in Egypt. Unto you, the frogs and the locusts and all the plagues aren't even going to touch the crops of the Israelites. He always left a way out for his people on the earth. But in this specific tribulation, trial, trouble, the day of God's wrath, the day of God's indignation, there's not one mention of the church that's a strange absence. Strange absence and not like God to not mention his church during the worst time in history. Not only that, in the epistles, the epistles, there's no mention of the great tribulation that's going to come. Paul, Peter, when they talk about persecution and trials that are facing those people, they were talking about the imminent threats that they were facing if they stood on the confession of Christ as Lord. Peter, the whole book of Peter, 1 Peter and 2 Peter, is exhorting the church at Rome, those that are elect and called by God, to stand strong. That this persecution is being witnessed all over the world, but the God of heaven is going to perfect strength. He's talking about a wave of persecution. He is not talking about the great tribulation. Get this, this is important to understand. The great tribulation is not the great persecution. The great tribulation is the great day of God's wrath. It's not a time of, it's going to be a time of persecution for those that don't receive the mark of the beast, those that are left behind and choose not to abide by the Antichrist system. And for the 144,000 Jewish evangelists that God will rise, God will raise. But the great tribulation in scripture is never defined as a great persecution phase for the church so it's important to distinguish between persecution in the epistles and the great tribulation in the book of revelation so the church is mentioned 19 times from revelation 1 through 3 and not one other time from Re until revelation 22 and verse 16 point number one there's no mention of the church after revelation 4 1 to revelation 22 16 point number two if you're just joining me now, please share this broadcast. You'll be a great help to me. Point number two, the removal of the restrainer is a biblical proof that the rapture will not uh, will take place before the tribulation. Well, let's study what the restrainer means. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 1 down through verse 9. Now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him... We ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled either by spirit or by word or by letter as if from us. Though the day of Christ had already come, let no one deceive you by any means. For that day, talking about the day of judgment, the day of tribulation, will not come unless the falling away comes first. Now I need to pause there because that word in the Greek, falling away, is apostasia. Apostasia is where we get the word apostasy, which the word in Greek means the departure from. When Paul is talking to Timothy and he says in the last days there's going to be a departure from the faith, he uses the word apostasia. Now the original Greek states this, the apostasia of pistis, which is faith. So Paul is making it very clear that the departure in the last days the departure that he's speaking of to Timothy, one of the signs of the last days is the departure from the faith, apostasia pistis. The word apostasia does not always refer to a departure from the faith. The word apostasia signifies a departure in general. So when Paul's talking to the Thessalonian church here and he says that the day will not come until the apostasia comes first. He's not saying the apostasia pistis, the departure from the faith. He is saying the departure. And many theologians have concluded that this apostasia, this departure, is referring to the departure of the saints from planet earth, the rapture of the church. 
That's why it's beneficial to know Greek. I don't know Greek, but I read people that do know Greek. And the man of sin is revealed, the Antichrist, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worship, and he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Do you not remember when I was with you how I told you these things? And now you know what is restraining, that when he may be revealed, and now you know what is restraining, that he, he may be revealed in his own time. Verse 7, pay special attention to verse 7. And the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he, capital H, who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. Then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. So the Bible says that the great tribulation era, the period of seven years of God's wrath, will not come until the departure of the saints takes place. And he that restrains is taken out of the way. Who is the restrainer of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2? The Bible makes it amply clear that there is someone preventing the purpose of Satan from coming to a culmination of evil on the earth. There is someone, there is a force on the earth that is a hindering force to the manifestation and the full-fledged pouring out of satanic evil and destruction on the earth. Who is the he of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2? The Bible makes that clear. First and foremost, it cannot be government, human government. Because the Bible says even throughout the Antichrist rule, there's going to be human government. So it's not human government. It's not gospel preachers because the Bible says that there's going to be 144,000 gospel preachers during the Great Tribulation. And there's actually going to be angels that preach the gospel from heaven declaring the everlasting gospel. So it can't be gospel preachers. Number three, it can't be the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit is omnipresent he is God just as much as God is God if the Holy Spirit were no longer on the earth he would cease to be omnipresent and cease to be God and contain or have the attributes of God it can't be the Holy Spirit because the Bible says people are going to be saved on the earth during 144 uh, during the time of tribulation and the 144,000s preaching of the gospel and people can't be saved unless the spirit draws them unless the spirit convicts of sin of truth and of judgment so the spirit is going to be actively involved on the earth during those days so the restrainer cannot be the holy spirit himself the holy spirit's not going to be an heavenly be a being or some angelic being because the scripture is very clear there will be angel, angelic activity on the earth during the great tribulation. So who is the restrainer in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2? The restrainer is the Holy Spirit in the temple being the church. See, understand this. In the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit could only come upon certain individuals. Only the king, the priest, and the prophet were anointed by the Holy Spirit. They had the hand of God upon them. The hand of the Lord came upon Elijah. And the hand of the Lord came upon Benaiah. And the hand of the Lord came on David. And the hand of the Lord came on such and such a person. In the Old Testament, that's how the Holy Spirit moved through people or moved on the earth. Remember, the Holy Spirit needs an agent on the earth to affect change because the Spirit was brooding over the surface of the deep in the Old Test in, in Genesis chapter 1, but it wasn't until God spoke that the Holy Spirit went to work to create the thing that God spoke. In the same vein, the Holy Spirit needs agents, people, humanity. He needs a responsible human vessel to speak the word in order for him to go to work and bring that thing to pass isaiah said it this way the lord god has spoken and his spirit shall gather it the word of the lord has commanded it and his spirit shall gather it the spirit watches over the word to confirm it and to do it to perform what it promises and so when the church is taken away the holy spirit will no longer be in the body of christ on the earth he will revert to the Old Testament method of coming upon certain individuals and moving on certain people. That's how it's going to be. 
That's how it's that's how it's going to be. Once the the restrainer, the 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 church, the spirit filled church is taken away, the Holy Spirit will revert back to the old covenant way and method of doing things, where He will come upon certain individuals to get certain tasks and assignments done. So the restrainer is the Holy Spirit in His church. Why else could we con- uh, confidently assert that that is true? Well. The Bible says we are the salt of the earth. We are the light of this world. We are the city set on a hill that cannot be hidden. What does salt do? Salt salt refrains things from decaying. Salt is a preservation um, tool, for lack of better words. Salt is a preservation tool that prevents things from decaying or rotting. You put salt on meats to prevent it from rotting. Jesus said you are the salt of the earth. When the salt of the church is removed from the earth, just think of it this way. Before the rapture of the church, things are going to be, even Paul said, peace and safety. There's going to be relative peace and relative safety on the earth. There's going to be a time of, 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 of seemingly a time of order on the earth during that time. The moment the church is taken, within seven years, the whole earth is going to go to splat. Total chaos. Total anarchy. The moment the salt, the preserving agent on the earth is removed, the restraining force being the church, the Holy Spirit infused church, it's not going to take but seven years for everything to degrade to a loss, anarchy-filled, deprived society on a whole, such as has not been witnessed even since the days of Noah and the days of Lot. So we're holding back this blast of evil that the Bible prophesies will come on the earth during the Antichrist's reign. Another reason why I believe the church to be the restraining force, the Holy Spirit infused church to be the restraining force, is Matthew 16, 18 is very clear to say, Jesus said, he gave a prophecy concerning his church. He said, I'm going to build my church and the gates of hell will never prevail against it. Well, we have a promise from Jesus in that very scripture that the gates of Hades the gates of Hades, the gates of hell, hell is Hades, will not prevent, uh, prevail against the church of the living God. One of the horsemen of the apocalypse during the time of the great tribulation is called death. The scripture says, him that sat on this pale green horse is called death, and behind him Hades follows. And there is given power over the entire earth to kill a fourth of those that dwell on the earth by sword, by pestilence, by famine, and by the wild beasts of the earth. So the scripture says Hades will have authority over the entire population of the earth to kill by sword, by pestilence, by famine, and by wild beasts of the earth. Jesus already said the gates of Hades Hades will not prevail against his church. Well, if the church is still on the earth during the great tribulation period, how is it that this being called Hades that is following the horse and the horseman called hell, the pale green horse and the horseman called hell that rides him, how is it that this being called Hades is prevailing over not a select few people, over all the population of the earth? It doesn't make sense. You cannot... um, you can't, you can't balance the two truths. You, cannot, you can't ignore one and focus on the other. You have to come and take both into play. If Jesus said Hades will never prevail against his church, and in the apocalypse or in the seven years of tribulation, there's going to be a being called Hades that's going to prevail over the entire population of the earth, then either Jesus was a liar or the church is not going to be on the earth during that time. Another reason why I believe that the spirit-filled church is the restraining force on the earth that needs to be removed before the great tribulation can come and the Antichrist can manifest himself is my basic understanding of dominion. This one's going to be your favorite one. If you're watching, pay attention and share the broadcast before I get into this. This one is going to be your favorite one. 
Because it's going to encourage you to live in authority today and it'll give you a better understanding why the church is not going to go through the tribulation period. Basic understanding of our dominion through Christ and our authority as believers of Christ on the earth disallows me from ever holding to a mid or post tribulation rapture. Why do I say that? Because the scripture says very clearly when the man of lawlessness is revealed, the antichrist comes to light, he's going to execute authority over all that dwell on the face of the earth. I'm blood bought. I'm redeemed. I have been connected with Christ. He is the head. I am the body. For the church to have to subject to the authority and dominion of the Antichrist throughout these seven years of tribulation, that would mean that not only the church has to subject itself, the head being Christ would have to surrender his dominion over the devil, over the Antichrist, and for a time of seven years, place himself subject to the rule and the reign of this beast that will come out of the sea. You cannot, anybody that has any understanding of the scripture cannot come to that conclusion. That would be, that's an impossibility. That's an unthinkable and heretical doctrine. My basic understanding of the dominion of Christ and the dominion of the believer connected to Christ does not allow me to hold to a mid or post tribulation rapture. Because the Bible says Jesus told his people, I give you power and authority. Over what? Over unclean spirits? I give you power and authority over unclean spirits and over all the power of the devil. And nothing shall by any means harm you. If you are the pinky toe of the body of Christ, you have power over all the power of the devil. And the Bible says you are seated with Christ in heavenly places far above principalities. Far above Satan. Far above the Antichrist. Far above any demon. And he has no op- ability or any um, power to dominate you. We have power to dominate the devil on the earth. And so if the church is still On the earth during that time, you'd have to either say Christ subjected himself to the rule and the dominion of the Antichrist for that time period, or B, Christ removes the dominion of the church and the authority of the church during that time period. We lose the keys of the kingdom to bind and to loose, and we are then forcibly, forcibly thrown in to this rotten era of, of world history. It, you, you, can't hold to, you cannot hold to the position of I have authority over Satan, demons, and principalities and I'm going to have to go through the time of the tribulation and submit myself to the Antichrist system and, or at least hide away from it. Listen, the reason why the Antichrist can't reveal himself right now is because even the littlest, smallest in their mind type of believer could literally go and march up to the doors of that Antichrist, knock on his door, say, Hi, Mr. Antichrist, in the name of Jesus, I command that spirit to come out of that person, and that would end, the, that would end his plan, that would end his scheme. That's why he has to wait. He cannot come because we have dominion on the earth Until we're taken off the earth, he can exercise his own dominion that God will give him for seven years. When the church is raptured, that will be the only time the Antichrist will be able to execute power on the earth. I mean, you think anybody, and in my experience, anybody that does hold to a post-trip or mid-trip rapture, all of them... All of them, pretty much all of them, have this defeatist mentality when it comes to victory in life. It like that's why I said this doctrine of pre-tribulation rapture, it it overspills. It it full it floods every other doctrine that you hold to in the Bible. Because you can't you can't hold to the doctrine that you're gonna go through the great tribulation. And also hold to the doctrine that you have authority over demons. You can't. You have to forfeit one or the other. 
You'll have to believe that either the church is going to lose its authority on the earth or that Christ himself, because remember, we are joined with Christ. It's the mystery of redemption. Christ and his body are one. We are one with Christ, joined to the Lord, one spirit with him. So if the body is going to subject itself to the rule of the Antichrist, the head also has to bow. It's not going to work. It's not going to work. And so people that do hold to a mid or post tribulation rapture, a lot of the times that theology spills into every other theology and they oftentimes are defeatist in their mentality never have victory constantly running away from the devil remember there's three types of christians on the earth there's those that whine about the devil constantly never know what to do with him constantly running away from him constantly hiding under their bed from him constantly trying to avoid and ignore his presence in fear live in fear of the devil number two there's people that constantly think they have to war against the devil i'm just battling demons battling devils ah man devil's on my back this week so they don't ignore the reality of the devil they believe that they will have victory over the devil but they they don't have any understanding of their immediate authority over the devil and as such they're constantly wrestling and when when paul said understand this when paul said we wrestle not against flesh and blood but against principalities and forces of darkness and heavenly places he wasn't saying that it's an even fight he wasn't saying we're always going to be wrestling as in like you know we're going to sweat they're going to sweat we're going to bleed they're going to bleed and but ultimately one day you're going to come up on top Paul was saying, while you're on the earth, there's always going to be opposition. But you have power with God because greater is he that lives in you than he that's in the world to cast down these strongholds, to tear down these pillars of darkness, to beat through the forces of darkness and exercise your God-given authority as those that are the head and never the tail, above and never beneath. So the whole we wrestle not against flesh and blood, it'd be like me getting into a ring with Mike Tyson in his prime. Sure, we can deem it a boxing match, but it ain't a competition in the same vein because we have an opposition, we have an adversary, the devil, who prowls around like a roaring lion. Because we're in this wrestling ring of life doesn't mean the competition is equal. We're not arm wrestling with the devil and it's some equal fight. We have authority by the name of Jesus that when mentioned and uttered through faith-filled lips brings every knee, every knee in heaven, on earth, and beneath the earth to bow to the authority of Jesus Christ. I have keys to bind at will and I have keys to loose at will. So number one, people that are constantly scared of the devil and running the other way don't even challenge him. Number two, those that are constantly battling devils throughout their life and never, have, never seem to have the victory. And then number three, and this is the body of Christians, the category of Christian I hold to and I know you do as you watch this broadcast. And those are those that understand that we're seated with Christ in heavenly places. That where Christ is far above, that's where I am. That because God's seed, his Holy Spirit lives in me, the wicked one cannot touch me. He doesn't get to dictate what I do. I dictate what he does. I'm not at the mercy of the devil's commands. The devil is at the mercy of my commands. He doesn't get to decide whether I leave or I stay. I decide whether he leaves or whether he stays. And he always has no, dis no choice in the matter. He's always commanded to leave. That's why Jesus said, those that believe in my name, they will what? Cast out devils. There's no record of the 144,000 evangelists during the Great Tribulation casting out devils. But the Bible does promise in this church age that as long as the redeemed church in Christ is on the earth, there will be devils being cast out, expelled, forcibly thrown out of people and peace restored to their mind. So number two reason, biblical proof why I believe in a pre-tribulation rapture is because I understand the dominion the church has in its present age. Number three reason, and this is important too, the church is exempt from divine wrath. The church is exempt from divine wrath. I'm going to go through scriptures. I'm going to read them all word for, word for word to prove this point. Because, and like I said, and I'm going to get into certain theological terms that are attributed to the Great Tribulation period. It doesn't say it's a day of great hope and a day of great joy and comforting. You study the Old Testament, 
the terms attributed to the Great Tribulation. The Great Tribulation is as such a day of wrath, a day of indignation, a day of trouble, a day of trial, a day of destruction, a day of desolation, a day unlike any other day in human history. A day of anger. So if, and everybody understands, everybody, whether you hold mid, post, or pre, everybody can agree that the tribulation period is a day of God's wrath being poured out on the earth. Well, as such, listen to what 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 9 says. The tribulation is God's wrath, as we can all agree on. 1 Thessalonians 5, 9 says, For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. So comfort one another and edify one another, just as you are doing. So if the tribulation is the day of God's wrath, but God has not appointed us unto wrath, then how could we, the church, be on the earth while God's pouring out His bowls and of wrath, the trumpets of wrath are sounded, and the seals that the Lamb is, un, is loosing uh, are, are releasing on planet earth manifestations of God's wrath on the earth. 1 Thessalonians 1.10, listen to this. Another scripture that proves this. We are to wait for His Son from heaven, whom He raised from the dead, even Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. It's not talking about hell. It's talking about the seven years of, of God's wrath on the earth. Romans chapter 5 and verse 9. I hope this makes it amply clear. <laughs> You're not going to be on the earth. I don't know why some people are so intent and so hard-headed that they want to be on the earth during this time. You, you can't hold to the position that I'm saved from wrath and then also I'm going to go through wrath all at the same time. The tribulation is the time of God's pounding His judgment on planet earth, on the deeds of the ungodly and on the wicked. Romans 5 and verse 9, listen to this, much more than having now been justified by His blood, we shall be saved from wrath through Him. Saved from the wrath. I want you to write that in the comment section. I am saved from wrath. I am saved from wrath. I don't have to go through the thing that Jesus saved me from. If Christ's blood, as we've read right now, saved us from wrath, and then we also hold to the belief that we're going to have to go through wrath, then we have to also believe that Christ's work of the cross, His blood being shed, was not totally effective. That it was effective to a certain level, but it remains ineffective because it hasn't even had the ability to preserve us from this wrath that shall come on the earth. And then you, I mean, you study Lot's story when God was going to pound Sodom and Gomorrah with hail, <coughs> fire, and brimstone. The Bible says that God sent angels. And remember, Jesus said in Matthew 13, the angels are the harvesters, the ones that are going to rapture. We're going to be caught up by these angels and meet the Lord in the clouds. When Lot was about when uh, Sodom and Gomorrah was about to go through hell on earth, God sent angels, harvesters, to do what? To pull Lot out. And then the wrath of God hit Sodom and Gomorrah. In Noah's day, God said, Noah, build an ark. When the ark was finally built and the door shut, then the wrath of God was released on the world of the ungodly and the earth that then existed perished, being flooded with water. So those are just two examples of God pulling out the righteous. Remember, Abraham prayed, Will you indeed, O God of all the earth, a God of justice and of mercy and compassionate, slow to anger, but abounds in steadfast love, are you indeed going to destroy the wicked with the righteous? Surely, surely you're not going to do that. Abraham, Abraham prayed that to God. God said, you're right, I won't do that. He said, if there's 50, will you do it? No, if there's 50, I won't. If there's 30, will you do it? No, if there's 30, I won't. If there's 20, if there's 10, will you do it? No, if there's 10, I won't. There wasn't even 10, there was one, Lot. Lot was the only righteous man. Second Peter 2 says, righteous Lot was tormented day and night by the deeds of the wicked. There was only one righteous man in all of Sodom and Gomorrah. And even though there was only one righteous, God still sent angels to pull him out before wrath was released on the earth. 
That tells you that the church is going to be pulled from the scene before the vials of God's wrath are poured out on the earth. And not only that, you can see from Revelation chapter 1 through 3 that the way Jesus deals with his church is with love, compassion, mercy. He's exhorting them. Repent. Turn from your wicked deeds. Or else I'm coming quickly and I'm going to remove the lampstand from you. Constantly repeating, I know your deeds. I know that you don't tolerate evil men. He's encouraging the church. He's... He, he's uh, He's diagnosing their problems and then he's giving correction and he's trying to train them back to where they, they, they fell off and they veered off the track off. But then you start with Revelation 6 and you talk about the Great Tribulation and what's happening on the earth during that time. There is, there is an amazing change in God's attitude and character towards humanity. From mercy, from Revelation 1 through 3, Jesus is still extending a hand of mercy. The moment Revelation 4, 1 comes... After that, the character of God changes from that of mercy to wrath and judgment. So just that should show you, if the church was on the earth, there'd still be mercy. There's none. There's none at all. There's not one iota of mercy in the Great Tribulation. Number four, so that was the church is exempt from divine wrath. If we have been called out of wrath, if we've been saved and preserved from wrath, and the tribulation is God's wrath on the earth, then obviously we cannot be on the earth during that time. Number four, why I believe in a pre-tribulation rapture. The rapture is a signless event. There's an imminency in talking about the rapture throughout the epistles. First Thessalonians 5 talks about the thief in the night. Jesus says, you also be ready for of such an hour the Son of Man cometh in an hour that you will not expect. It's something believers are to be looking for at all times. Philippians 3, I read it before. I'll read it one more time. Philippians chapter 3, the Bible says in verse 20, our citizenship is in heaven from which we also eagerly await for the Savior, the Lord, Jesus Christ. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 verse 1 says the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. So if you hold to a post-tribulation rapture theory, then you would be able to tell from the moment Antichrist rises to the moment Jesus comes, the second time, there's going to be seven years. Exactly. So you'd be able to go back in time. Okay, Antichrist rose uh, in the year X. Let's calculate seven years from then. This is the exact day that Jesus will come back because that's exactly seven years from the rise of Antichrist um, to the second coming. And so the post-tribulation rapture doesn't allow for this imminency. You know, Jesus is constantly exhorting his people. Be ready. The, the, the Bible says at the midnight hour, the, 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 the call was heard from heaven. A cry came from heaven. Come and meet the bride. Come and meet the bridegroom. For all things are ready. There is this sense of, of uh, surprise in reference to this coming of the Lord that we're going to meet the Lord in the clouds. A post-tribulation rapture does not allow for this imminency, and a mid-tribulation rapture does not allow for this imminency. Only a pre-tribulation rapture allows for an imminent, signless coming. See, the, tribu the, the second coming has many signs attributed to it. Matthew 24, there's going to be wars, rumors of wars. There's going to be signs in the heavens above. There's going to be war, perplexity amongst nations. There's going to be the war, the, the waves of the sea roaring and rising. The scripture says there's going to be, uh, um, there's going to be earthquakes, famines, pestilences in various places. That's talking about Revelation 6 through 19. Those are all signs that you're going to be in the great tribulation rapture of the great tribulation period. The rat, but when Paul talks about this coming of the Lord and our gathering to Him, the scripture is very clear that there is no sign in reference to that coming. There's no hint, there's no indication. The reason why we use Matthew 24 to show that the rapture is near is because if you see the signs for the second coming already multiplying and increasing on the earth, then we can know that the rapture, which is seven years before, is that much sooner. Number five, reason why I believe in a pre-tribulation rapture, is the truth of the rapture is intended to bring joy and hope, not depression. 
and anxiety. Why do I say that? Well, 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 18, when he talks about the rapture, he finishes off by saying, therefore comfort one another with these words. Now, if Paul was saying, you're about to go through the worst period of human history, a third of the earth is going to die in one day, earthquakes are going to separate islands and mountains, the sun's going to be turned to, bl- uh, to dark, the moon's going to be turned to blood, people are going to die from all kinds of viruses, there's going to be... Uh, um, an antichrist that rises, that's going to call and demand for your head to be chopped off. You're going to go through the worst period of human history that has ever happened. So comfort one another with these words. Would that be at all comforting? (laughs) No, you'd have to go on Prozac. The reason why it's a comforting thing to know about the rapture and to believe in this pre-tribulation rapture is because we understand we're not going to have to go through all those things. Telling people they're going to go through and endure the seven years of horrible, horrible human history doesn't bring uh, comfort. It brings distress. How would telling anybody that they're about to experience hell on earth for seven years bring any sense of relief? The Bible calls it the blessed hope of his rapture, his return. It's a blessed hope, not a crippling hope, a blessed hope. Not only that, Revelation 3, let me read this. I was going to get it before, but let me read this. Revelation chapter 3 and verse 10. Listen to this. Revelation 3.10. Because you've kept my command to persevere, I will keep you from the hour of trial that will come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. Two things I have to note from this passage. Jesus is saying, because you've kept my command to persevere, I'm going to keep you. From the hour of trial, that word keep in the Greek refers to not, I'm going to empower you to go through it, or I'm going to preserve you while you go through it. The word keep in the Greek in this instance is referring to um, immunity to these things escaping from these things. Remember, Luke 21, Jesus is talking about the signs concerning his second coming, but then he turns to the people and he says, pray always that you may be counted worthy to escape the things that are going to come on the earth. So Jesus in Revelation 3.10 is talking about escaping the hour of trial that will come on the whole earth. That word... Uh, to, dwe- to test those who dwell on the earth. That word dwell in this instant is not referring to a um, temporary dwelling. You know, the Bible refers to Christians as pilgrims, people who don't see this earth as an eternal dwelling place. We don't see this earth as somewhere where we're going to spend eternity. We don't see this earth as something that we consider our own, our own possession. We're not looking on what the Bible says the, the deeds of this world and the world thereof is passing away. We are those who do the will of our Father who will endure forever. When the, the word used here to test those who dwell on the earth, that word dwell is not talking about pilgrims. It's talking about those who have decided to make earth their permanent dwelling place, who have bought into the Antichrist system, who have received the mark of the beast. Jesus says, because you've kept my command to persevere, I'm going to cause you to escape the hour of trial, which will come upon the whole world to those who have chosen the Antichrist system, who have chosen to make earth their home, who have chosen to focus Focus in on their material possessions and have no thought given towards eternity and have no desire. Remember Jesus said, if these people were of my kingdom, they would defend me. These are not of my kingdom. They are of the world and the desire of their father they want to do. That's the type of people that will go through this great tribulation. Those who have made earth their home. Who give no thought to eternity. Number six. Why I believe in a pre-tribulation rapture. Number six, the enthroned elders in Revelation chapter four. Listen to this. And around the throne were 24 thrones. And on the thrones, I saw 24 elders sitting clothed in white robes and they had crowns of gold on their heads. And from the throne proceeded lightnings, thunderings, and voices. Seven lamps of God burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Before the throne, there was a sea of glass like crystal. And in the midst of the throne and around the throne were four living creatures full of eyes in front and in back. Uh, 
Let me move on to verse 9. Whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever and cast their, throne, their crowns before the throne and they sing. You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory, power, and honor for you created all things and by your will they exist and created. Who are these 24 elders? <coughs> I believe, and I'm going to show you why from the Bible, why I believe these 24 elders are representatives of the redeemed in heaven, the church in heaven after the rapture. Why do I believe that? Several reasons. I've written down six. Number one, the Old Testament, 1, Corinthians, uh, 1 Chronicles chapter 24, the Bible says, in referring to the priesthood of Aaron and his sons, because there were so many priests in that day that they couldn't all enter into the temple and all be in the temple at once, they divided them. There were more leaders found of the sons of Eliezer than the sons of Ithamar, and thus they were divided. First Chronicles 24.4. Among the sons of Eliezer were 16 heads of their fathers houses and eight heads of their father's houses among the sons of Ithamar. Thus they were divided by lot, one group as another, for there were officials of the sanctuary and officials of the house of God from the sons of Eliezer and the sons of Ithamar. The sons of Eliezer and, Ism Eliezer and Ithamar, the two sons of Aaron, and because there were more priests from the sons of Eliezer than Ithamar, they were divided. Sixteen presbyters, overseers or elders, were designated to rule or to represent the subgroups of the sons of Eliezer. Then eight rulers, presbyters, elders, were representatives of the eight under Ithamar. 16 plus eight. You have a calculator? You don't need one? It's 24. There were 24 elders that represented these priests that were to minister before God in his temple. Now understand this. In the New Testament, we are made kings and priests unto our God and unto our Savior. And as such, could it be that these 24, which the Greek word used there is presbyterios, these 24 presbyters, elders, overseers, representatives, are representatives of the redeemed church of God in heaven that has been raptured up, preserved from the great tribulation period, and are worshiping God in heaven from that time onward. I believe it is so. Number two reason why I believe that. They're clothed in white. Look at the description the Bible gives these 24 elders. They're clothed in white. They have white robes of righteousness. Who has white robes of righteousness in heaven? Who has the privilege of being clothed in white other than the redeemed? The Bible says very clearly, only the redeemed are going to receive clothes of white, signifying our being clothed with Christ and our righteousness now because of the work of Christ at the cross. Number three, they have crowns of gold, of righteousness, which is promised for only who? Promised for the redeemed. Number four, there were 12 tribes of Israel, and then there's 12 tribes, uh, uh, sorry, 12 apostles which Jesus said, you are the 12 apostles who will judge the 12 tribes of Israel. 12 plus 12, 24. Could it be that 12 of these presbyters represent Old Testament saints and 12 of these presbyterios, these elders, represent New Testament saints? I believe it is so. Number five, the enthronement of Christ is promised. The enthronement with Christ, sorry, is promised to only the redeemed. The Bible doesn't say these are just around the throne. The Bible doesn't say these are just um, on the outskirts of heaven. These are described as being enthroned with Christ. They have 24 thrones around the throne of Christ. Jesus told James and John when they wanted to be seated, one on his right and one on his other, on his left in the, the new kingdom. In the kingdom of God. Jesus said it's not for you to decide who gets those thrones. But it's for those who are appointed by my father. And the Bible says very clearly. That we are seated with Christ in heavenly places. Could it be 
that these are the enthroned redeemed, the represent representation of the enthroned redeemed in heaven. I absolutely believe that. Enthronement is not promised to any angel. Enthronement is not promised to any <coughs> heavenly being. Enthronement is promised to only one category of being, and that is the redeemed. And then number six, Revelation chapter five. Listen to this. Revelation chapter five and verse nine. Verse eight, and when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb and they sang a new song saying, you are worthy to take the scroll to open its seals for you were slain and you have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe, tongue, people and nation and have made us kings and priests unto our God and we shall reign on the earth. Well, who in the world has the right to sing that other than the redeemed? So reason number six why I believe in a pre-tribulation rapture is because these 24 elders that are around the throne of God are enthroned, clothed in white, and they're singing a new song that only the redeemed can sing. Only those that, that, that have been saved from wrath can sing. Only those that have been redeemed out of every tribe, people, nation, and tongue can sing. Number seven reason why I believe in a pre-tribulation rapture, and this one's important, and I'm going to finish off with this. Christ is not coming back for a bruised and battered and bloodied, barely holding on church. Which the Bible says, those that are going to be saved at the second coming of Christ after the great tribulation, that's how they're going to be. They're going to be barely holding on. They're going to be attempting with all their might to endure to the end. Ephesians 5 <coughs> says very clearly that Christ is coming, that he might present his bride to himself as a glorious bride without spot and without wrinkle. The people on earth during the great tribulation are going to be crying for the rocks to fall on them so that they might escape this. And they won't be able to. Death will flee them, the Bible says. So if Christ is coming back for a glorious bride, then obviously it's not going to be the people that, are, that come to the Lord during that great tribulation period that are going to be literally holding on by the skin of their teeth and eagerly waiting for that great day when Christ will come back with his church to rescue them having persevered through the great day of tribulation. Remember this, we're connected with Christ. We're joined and knit together with Christ Jesus. We're not separate from Christ. We are one with him. So if judgment came on the church, judgment would have to come on Christ himself too. Because we're his body. We'd have to be pounded with these seals of God's wrath that have been opened, these trumpets. We'd have to be pounded. We'd be bruised and bloodied. But the Bible says in 1 John 4, 17, we have boldness in the day of judgment. We're not going to be barely holding on in this great day of judgment. We have boldness in the day of judgment. The Bible says we've been perfected and delivered from all judgment. 1 John 3 says we've passed from judgment unto life. And the great tribulation is the great day of God's judgment on the earth. We've passed out of judgment into life. I mean, think of it this way. We are the bride of Christ. We're going to be presented to Christ as a glorious bride. Even in the natural. Which of you, if you were getting married next Saturday, would let your spouse get bruised, raped, beat up, bruised, black eye, slapped around, thrown off a moving train before, the, before your wedding day? And then Saturday comes and you get, you get wed and she's got a blue eye, black eye, missing a leg, missing teeth. That's not how you, he wouldn't like that very much, would you? Well, Christ is not going to let his church get literally ransacked by hell and the Antichrist system for seven full years only to receive him to, her to himself as a bloodied, bruised, and ugly bride. We're going up seven years before the second coming as a glorious bride. The dead in Christ will rise first. The trumpet's going to sound. We who are alive will be caught up. And the bride will be presented to the groom, not having any blemish or any such thing. If we need to pass through the great tribulation, then his promise 
of John 5.24. What did he promise in John 5.24? John 5.24. Listen to this. Most assuredly I say to you, he who hears my words and believes in him whom he sent has everlasting life and shall never come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. Passed from death to life. If we have to pass through the judgment of the great tribulation, then we've obviously, that Christ was a liar. And that promise is rendered ineffective. And I'll give you a bonus point. Every invading nation always secures its ambassadors before it invades it with its armies. Always. They'll always pull out their ambassadors. That's why you know when ambassadors are pulling out of Libya or whatever, that there's something about to take place. There's going to be an attack on that nation because they have intel that some dreaded attack and horror is about to be unleashed on that specific nation in that specific area of that nation. We are ambassadors for Christ on the earth. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Before Christ comes and releases His seals and trumpets and vials and bowls of judgment, He's pulling out His ambassadors. He's pulling out His representatives because His invading kingdom and wrath is about to spread throughout the whole entire earth. Those are seven plus one bonus reasons why I believe in a pre-tribulation rapture theory and truth, not just theory, truth. And if you still don't agree with me, we'll agree to disagree, no problem. I've read the post-tribulation rapturist theory. You don't have to message me after this broadcast and tell me I, I've read it. I studied it. If you are looking to dive deeper into this and you want to sharpen yourself more, I would recommend getting this book by Dr. Mark Hitchcock. It's 101 Answers to the Most Asked Questions of the End Times. Dr. Mark Hitchcock. He's a brilliant expositor of eschatological truths and I would recommend buying that. Another book, if you want to go even deeper, that's like pretty much the beginner's guide. I'd start off with this. But if you want another book, that, that is phenomenal, but if you want to dig, dig deeper and study the entirety of post, prib, mid, who's the Antichrist, all that, I would go into this, Things to Come, a study in biblical eschatology by J. Dwight Pentecost. And oddly enough, he was not a Pentecostal, he was a Baptist, but nonetheless, a brilliant mind, and it's a classic when it comes to the study of the end times. Those are two books I would recommend. This book, I mean, I'll just read you a few of the chapter headings. General questions about prophecy and end times. Number two, the rapture. Section three, the Antichrist. Section four, the tribulation. Section five, the Armageddon. Section six, the second coming. Section seven, the, the millennium. Section eight, the afterlife. Section nine, my top question for you. Chronology of the end times. It's a very practical, hands-on book, and uh, it'll help you a lot. Simplify all these, you know, sometimes complex theological terms and make it very practical and usable for you and give you a, a, a defense in your heart to give a defense for the hope that is in you. Jessica on YouTube, the books are 101 Answers to the Most Asked Questions in the End Times by Dr. Mark Hitchcock. And the second book is Things to Come by J. Dwight Pentecost. Um, Things to Come, J. Dwight Pentecost. If you can... If you, if you didn't catch the book now, just rewind at the end of this broadcast and, and, and get it. But they're, they're phenomenal books and teachings. That's where I, I got the majority of my content today. Also, the guest that I had on last week, Evangelist Tiff Shuttlesworth, I would highly encourage, if you haven't already, to subscribe to his YouTube channel. His YouTube channel is blowing up. It's going, he's gone viral to a certain level. And uh, I would recommend you subscribe to his channel if you want to dive deeper. This is his main game. This is like, when it comes to evangelism and eschatology, that's... It's, he's, he's a sharp tool in those areas and I would highly recommend you um, sit under his teachings. It's going to help you a lot. And he, like I said on the broadcast Thursday, I don't know of a better voice for truth who carries integrity and the deep fear and reverence of God and His Word. So he's not twisting and perverting things, but he's been approved by God to be entrusted with this Word. And I don't know of a better source for truth, biblical truths and ex. Um, exegetical study of these biblical truths than evangelist Tip Shuttlesworth. I really don't, so I would do that. 
For everyone that's watching right now, if you haven't given your life to Jesus Christ, the Bible says there's one qualification for the rapture. One qualification and one only. Not everybody's going to go up in the rapture. Only those who've made their life right with God. How do you do that? The ball's not in God's court. He's already done everything that he possibly could do to make sure that heaven becomes your home. Jesus said in John 14, I've gone to prepare a place for you, but believe in me so that when I come again, I will receive you to myself. We are closer than ever. I titled this, What is the Timing of the Rapture? Some of you might have thought I was going to give a day or an hour. No man knows the day or the hour. But we are certainly in the season. The last prophecy that was to be fulfilled before the rapture could take place was the restoration of national Israel, which happened May 14th, 1948. And so we are in, I believe, the last few milliseconds of time where Christ will come for His church, His bride. And then... The earth will enter into the worst period of human history where God's wrath will be poured out on the earth such as has never been witnessed from the dawn of time neither will ever be witnessed in any other period after that. But there's a way you can escape the wrath to come. The way to do it is we've not been appointed, as the Bible says, to, to wrath but we have been appointed to salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. Do you know Christ as Lord and Savior? I'm not saying have you been married to religion. I'm saying have you been married to Christ? Is your, right, is your life right in the eyes of God? Have you turned from sin and turned to God? Have you placed your faith in the finished work of Calvary? In that you believe that Christ took upon Himself our sin so that we could be released from the debt of sin that was attributed to each and every one of our account and, release, and, and receive freedom from sin. And right standing with God as such. If you've not done that, you need to do it right now. Today's the day of salvation. Now's the day to be saved. Get right with God. You're either living in victory over sin or sin is living in victory over you. Jesus isn't coming back for a bride that's full of sin. A bride that's been washed, purged of sin, cleansed. The only way you can do that is through the blood of Jesus Christ. The Bible says, who can say I've made my life clean? Who can say I'm pure from my sin? Only those that have been washed by the blood. Have you been washed by the blood? I don't mean have you slayed a lamb and put that natural lamb's blood. I'm saying have you placed your faith in Jesus and received His work for your life so that you can escape the torment and power and kingdom of the devil and darkness and enter into the kingdom of God? If not, today's your day. Pray this with me. From the bottom of your heart, say this with me. Say, Father, in Jesus' name, I come to you I give you my life. I believe you raised Christ from the dead. I believe that Jesus is my Lord and I confess Him to be my Savior. I will live for you. I'll never turn back. I leave this world behind me. And from today, I'll walk with Christ. I'll talk with Christ. Old things pass away. Everything becomes new. I'll never be the same again. I am saved. My sins are forgiven. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Make all things new. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. If you are saved, if you just prayed that prayer first and foremost, I'd love for you to get in contact with me by going to salvationnow.ca. The first link that pops up is I just got saved. Fill out that form. Get it to me. I want to, uh, I want to hear from you. And also there's a link at the bottom of the page to a YouTube video. Four things I would tell every Christian. Four basic things. Every Christian must know. Click it. Listen to it. It's going to help you greatly. If you're watching right now and you feel like you're lukewarm, you feel like you're like one foot in, one foot out. You feel like you need to rededicate, recommit your life to Christ. That you haven't been living in light of His return, the imminent return of Jesus Christ. That even when lightning flashes in the sky, you were like me when I was on my way to hell in a handbasket. You thought, man, did the rapture just happen right now? And you got scared. If you hear a message like this and fear fills your heart, then you, there's something wrong. When you hear a message like this, joy and hope, and faith and comfort and peace should fill your heart. If you don't have that comfort and you're lukewarm, and the Bible says if you're lukewarm, I'll spit you out of my mouth. You have that ringing in your ears constantly that you're afraid that you're going to be one of those spit and vomit out of, mouth, out of the mouth of Christ because you haven't made your priorities, kingdom priorities. 
I'm not here to beat you down or throw you down or cast you down. I'm here to tell you it's not too late. And I'm going to pray that the fire of God comes on you right now. And like those five wise virgins, you're not going to be one who doesn't have enough oil in your lamp. You'll have oil and enough to keep your lamp burning to the end. To be used by God in the time preceding the rapture. To bring in a end time harvest of souls. To preach this gospel in all the earth before the end comes. In Jesus name I pray Father for those that have grown weary and fatigued. And maybe have dropped the ball. I ask you reinvigorate them by your Holy Ghost right now. Fill them with a fresh fire. And just like the fire in the Old Testament temple could never go out. Let that fire that's ignited on their altar of their heart right now never go out baptize them afresh in the fire of God that would keep them pure keep them persevering and keep them focused on him who's the author and perfecter of our faith in Jesus name in the name of Jesus Christ I thank you father for refreshing and a, a fresh infusion of diligence and a drive that Paul had that said, I don't consider my life as any account dear to myself. But from now, I'm going to finish my course with joy. And I'm going to testify of the gospel of the grace of God. And I'm going to do what God's called me to do. In Jesus' name. If you prayed that with me, just pray amen. Shout amen. Write amen in the comment section.